Well, hello everyone and welcome. My name is Sharon Bonney. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for the Coalition on Adult Basic Education. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to Patrick Brown, a friend and colleague that I've worked with for some years here. He is an award-winning um, executive director at the State Association there in Michigan. And I know he's transitioning to a new uh, department and a new job, but he has worked faithfully with us and collaboratively with us on the State Advocate for Adult Education Fellowship, the State Association Leadership Institute, our regional meetings, and many, many other initiatives. So I'm excited to present to you Patrick Brown, who's going to share his award-winning session. Um, it received five out of five stars at the COEB conference, which is why we tapped him and asked if he would present for National Apprenticeship Week. So with that, I'll turn it over to Patrick Brown. Great, thank you so much, Sharon. And I am actually going to go off camera because I may have some low internet, um, but thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, everyone, and welcome to National Apprenticeship Week. I think this is a wonderful opportunity to share out about how adult education can align with apprenticeship, uh, pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship ready activities. Um, and I'm honored that COABE asked me to present and to share a little bit about the work that we're doing in Michigan. As Sharon said, I am um, wearing two hats today as I transition from my role as director of our state association, the Michigan Adult Community and Alternative Education Association. And I'm transitioning to a new role as the director of adult student attainment strategy at the Michigan College Access Network. In both of these roles, uh, my responsibilities have been how do we uh, align policies, programming, and professional development to create more opportunities for our adult learner population to have access to employment, future training opportunities, and uh, apprenticeship and college going uh, opportunities. So I'm excited to be here today to talk to you. The first thing that I would ask you is to think about um, is where do you sit on the adult education and apprenticeship opportunities scale? Many of us have been um, in this space of trying to figure out how does adult education, work readiness, integrated education and training, um, workforce talent, apprenticeship, how do they all fit within this? And I'd like you just to take um, a moment to think about where you sit on this scale. Um, and I'm going to ask you if you can to put in the chat uh, on a scale of one to five, one being um, we're not very far along in our development, or number five, we're very far along in our development. Uh, what end of the spectrum do you sit on in terms of integrating adult education and apprenticeship training? Are you underdeveloped, kind of a one? Are you burgeoning at like a three? Are you fully developed and you should be giving this presentation at a five? Where do you sit on that scale? If you wouldn't mind just popping that into the chat. Great, I love to see the interaction. And again, we're just uh, putting our numbers in of where we sit kind of on this adult education apprenticeship scale on a scale of one to five, one being I'm still wanna learn more and five being we're really well developed. So thank you all for sharing that. I also have a few other questions that I'd like you to consider today. Uh, the first is what partners do I need to have at the table? The most important thing that I hope you take away from today is that you as an adult education provider do not have to go at this alone. You have so many partners within your own state that I'm sure many of you are aware of, as well as national partners like COABE who have a plethora of resources that you have access to. So I'd like you to think about, um, and then throughout today, jot down who are those partners uh, that you need to have in your corner and at your table. Second is what skills and abilities do the learners in my community possess? Our learners are the fabric of what we do, the cornerstone of what we do in our programming. And we need to understand their interests, their knowledge, their abilities, and their hopes and dreams intimately. So I want you to identify and think about the learner populations that you have. Um, many of the things that we'll talk about today are underdeveloped because our learners haven't have access, have not had access to these resources before. And so we have an opportunity here to think about how do we bring these resources to them. Um, 
And then think lastly, what are the spaces that I'm not knowledgeable about and who can help me? Uh, we cannot know everything and adult education cannot do everything. Um, but we have access to some really quality partners and resources. And I want you to think about uh, where your weak points are and who might be able to help you fill in that knowledge gap uh, as you think about these opportunities. I wanted also to share just a little bit about our association. I am from the proud state of Michigan and our Michigan Adult Community and Alternative Education Association. We are the leading professional development organization in our state. We've got over 500 members spread across 120 different agencies. We have representation of community colleges, nonprofit agencies, public school programs, community-based agencies, training providers, and our focus is on professional learning, professional networking, and resource sharing and best practices. Um, like many associations, we are made up of a regional representation of directors, teachers, administrators, and we do really work collaboratively with other statewide partners on policy and advocacy initiatives. So a lot of the work that we um, have accomplished has been through our state association. So I would encourage you to think about if you're a part of your own state association, how you might leverage some of these conversations through that avenue, how you might lean into resources available from COABE, or if you're a local director and you don't have access to those resources, how can you leverage the resources that you do have uh, accessible to you? I also wanted to describe a little bit about what adult learning looks like in Michigan. Each state is very unique and very different, and I wanted to set the context for you about uh, what it looks like in our state. We serve approximately 28,000 learners in our state and federally funded adult education programs in Michigan. It's administered through our Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. We have over 118 individual providers of adult education with over 340 site locations. And Michigan is a very um, wide spread, uh, spread out state. We have major metropolitan areas, but it also takes probably about 12 hours to drive from one tip of one part of the state to the other. And we have our two lovely uh, peninsulas. We have providers, including public schools, nonprofit agencies, community colleges, and workforce development partners. And we, we receive um, both state funding, a strong state funding through our School Aid Act, as well as federal funds through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, Title II, so Title II services. Uh, our providers also work in coordination according to the 10 regional prosperity regions. And there's a collection of partnerships uh, within those prosperity regions with uh, local training providers as well. One of the other things is that our state has an established state apprenticeship expansion uh, office, which focuses on registered apprenticeship opportunities. Uh, as a part of this office, there is a state registered apprenticeship dashboard. Um, when I send the link and the recording, you'll have access to this dashboard, and many states have some a similar resource. So I would encourage you to think about if your state has access to this resource and if you are able to uh, find this information. Uh, and it's a really a plethora of information about what are active apprenticeships available in our state, in your specific state, um, and where they're located geographically, what industry or sector they're located in, and who is taking advantage of those opportunities. So ours is administered through our state apprenticeship office in our Department of Labor, uh, and I would encourage you to look and find your apprenticeship uh, leading expertise within your own state. The other space that I think is important to think about is why we're talking about integrating adult learning and apprenticeship together into one landscape. Um, apologies, I'm seeing that perhaps my audio isn't here. 
hopefully you can hear me. If not, I'll ask Sharon just to send me a message or, or uh, unmute to, to clarify. But um, I think it's important that we see adult education and apprenticeship as two partners coming together. Um, and really, there are four goals that we have. One is that we want through this webinar, and I think through all of our uh, projects over COAB this week, is to assist adult education programs to move towards implementing or partnering with apprenticeship programs. It really is integrated education and training 2.0. Let's move it to the next level. We also want to accelerate more learners into additional opportunities. So please uh, think about um, the goal that we have here is to give more opportunities to our learners and accelerate them into more pathways. We also want to meet continued WIOA outcomes. That's really important, not only for our continued success and being funded under those um, provisions, but also to meet statewide targets for talent. Our states, uh, our country really is facing a talent shortage. And adult education aligned with apprenticeship really can meet the demands. Lastly, I think it's always important that we think about creating a template for adult education and apprenticeship alignment. That's what we're trying to do in our state of Michigan. And my hope is that we can help you think about how to build upon your successes in your state, as well as uh, capture future successes if this landscape is not fully developed at this point for you. In addition to um, my role as the director of our state association, I also am a representative on our statewide Michigan Apprenticeship Advisory Board. This is a state level board consisting of members from multiple industry sectors, including labor, secondary and post-secondary education, workforce development, our workforce development state leadership board, and the US Department of Labor, Office of Apprenticeship. Uh, you may have something similar within your state. And I would urge you to find out who sits on this advisory board. Prior to our state association representative on the representation on this board, there was not anyone talking about adult education within this fabric and understanding. These are the movers and shakers within our state around training and workforce and apprenticeship. And adult education needs to be at the table. So if you're in a state association leader, I would encourage you to think about finding out about your board within your state. If you're a local director, even understanding if you have representation from your region or from your local municipality or your local area or partners on that board could be really critical and key. This board in Michigan provides guidance on innovation and implementation strategies to expand registered apprenticeship opportunities. This is the place where money flows and where opportunity comes when it relates to apprenticeship opportunities. In addition to my serving on the board, I have also worked on a couple of other projects which have led us to this partnership that I'm gonna talk about today. One is the Michigan Apprenticeship Readiness Certificate called the MARC, which is a two-level certification process that essentially tells employers that if a participant has participated in adult education or apprenticeship, pre-apprenticeship training program, they have the following skills available. They um, have soft skills developed, they have technical skills developed, and they're ready to go for employment and training. Uh, that's a project that I've been working on. The other, which we'll talk about today, is the Michigan Statewide Targeted Apprenticeship Inclusion and Readiness System, or the My Stairs. So in order to talk about now and where we go, I have to go a little bit into the past. Uh, this project started in 2021 and has been a two-year process for us in the state of Michigan. And at that time, the state of our state, our Department of Labor, was awarded a state apprenticeship expansion equity and innovation grant from the U.S. Department of Labor. 
And within that, it called for the focus of increasing the number of participants from typically underrepresented population and registered apprenticeships. It also called for increasing focus on apprenticeship readiness and creating pathways to get more people into apprenticeship training. And ultimately, uh, another focus was increasing apprenticeship going opportunities around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so I'd like to credit our Department of Labor within our state uh, for thinking about this, thinking about the opportunities that are available, and thinking about what could possibly be. So from that initial grant or seed money that was available, um, a grant opportunity was created called My Stairs. And this particular grant opportunity is to create registered apprenticeship programming for these select populations, women, people of color, individuals without a high school equivalency or completion credential, and individuals with disabilities. And for the first time in probably 30 years, uh, in particular, individuals without a high school equivalency or completion credentials were specifically named as a target population. Uh, and that's where our state association and our adult learning landscape was brought in to this apprenticeship opportunity. So I would encourage you within your local state uh, and your local programs to think about really naming and identifying who are some of the key populations that should be targeted through apprenticeship opportunities and, and, and specifically naming individuals without a equivalency or, or completion um, has really set the bar uh, important for us. One of the other elements was the creation of a registered apprenticeship Michigan statewide marketing campaign. This, the intent of this was to improve registered apprenticeship awareness and increase inclusion in our labor force. Um, and like I said, this has been a step-by-step -step process as we all work together to share out these opportunities, not only with uh, adult education providers, not only with training providers and employers, but most importantly, with our adult learners to see themselves within this apprenticeship space. So at the table, we had to have some key stakeholders. This included members of our adult education office, so our team that administers our adult education programming within the state of Michigan. We had our representation from the State Apprenticeship Expansion Office, which is the team that leads apprenticeship programming in our state. We also had to have key stakeholders from several key employers, the governor's office was engaged in conversation, as well as our state adult education association. And we actually held um, these meetings as well as thinking about this long-term planning for this project at our adult education offices, which uh, was a really well, quite an honor for us to participate and to think about this. Uh, in order to get started, we had to have a vision, and we used something called the Innovation Process Model, uh, and we called it our Adult Education and Apprenticeship Process. Uh, I'm going today to talk, I'm going to walk you through our Innovation Process Model and encourage you to think about implementing this Innovation Process Model for your own Adult Education Apprenticeship Process. But also, this is a really helpful tool to think about to applying to a variety of different scenarios and situations. So at the outset, in order to get us to the table, we had to review our current state of registered apprenticeships in the state. We looked statewide, we looked nationally, had many conversations with COABE about the resources, and that involved a lot of discussion. We also reviewed the goals of our program, what our intended target populations were, who they are. We talked a lot about how adult education works. We talked about how adult learners are different from traditional learners. We talked about subcategories of adult learners, including English language learners and high school equivalency learners and high school diploma learners. We talked about uh, and learned a lot about pre-apprenticeship versus apprenticeship opportunities. 
and there was a lot of discussion. And then we ultimately decided that we needed to implement this five-step process model for implementing the statewide grant in order to get more adult learners into this apprenticeship and training space. And so there was a lot of discussion. <laughs> if you haven't picked up on that, I want to reiterate this. There was a lot of discussion. This process, like I said, started probably in the summer of 2021 and took about six months for us to really learn about each other, learn about the roles that we all have, and to think about where we all might move together. In the first step in this process, uh, we needed to follow step one, and this is following the innovation process model. In step one, you identify your opportunities, the current state, and your desired state. So I took a screenshot of uh, kind of our draft um, step one. We had to identify what were the opportunities that existed currently within our adult education and apprenticeship process. Um, one of the things that we wanted to think about was creating a pathway um, to become an adult education professional through an apprenticeship training opportunity. We have a teacher shortage, we have an educator shortage in our state. We also wanted to expand upon our existing programming in adult education. We have a strong career and technical program that offers uh, operates in our state uh, and some are embedded uh, with adult education programming. So how can we build upon that success? We also wanted to think about bringing more leaders into this space. Our state association is in a position where we can serve as a leader and have an, a, both a fiduciary as well as a professional development leader for this adult education apprenticeship space. There is a space for us to be a leader in that. And I would encourage you to think about for your state association, how do you be a part of that? We also wanted to expand upon our existing integrated education and training program. Our providers have been spending eight to 10 um, years working on integrated education and training. And so how do we capitalize and build on that? We also wanted to think about how our adult learners can join the Apprenticeship Learning Network, which is a network of um, apprenticeship training providers that's already in existence within our statewide uh, workforce development system. We uh, looked at who are the uh, people that are needed at the table in order to do this. And we also identified both current state objectives and desired state objectives. In the current state, you describe what it means. And in our desired state, we had to describe what we, what we hope to accomplish or what we hope to change. And this was a really important task for us. This took us several weeks to go through this process. And I included the example of in our state at that time, we identified that when someone said the word apprenticeship, employers would think about it being a union and that registered apprenticeship was not accessible for small or mid-sized employers. And therefore it's just only things that can happen in big cities with big employers. And ultimately our desired state and what we hope to accomplish by the end of this is that employers of all sides understand the benefits of this um, and understand how it applies to both union and non-union non employees, as well as how to engage with adult education in this landscape. So that's just one example of the step one process innovation. If you have questions or comments, I would encourage you to put uh, them into the chat uh, and we can follow up and address those as well. In the second process flow, again, each parts of this process took several weeks. Uh, we had to analyze solution options and benchmarks. What is really attainable for our state over the next couple of years with our economic climate, what is attainable with the number of adults who are seeking training opportunities or employment? 
what if what if any disparities do we note in the types of employment opportunities our adult learners typically go into versus the desired state of where we would like to build apprenticeship opportunities? One of the major industries in our state is obviously construction. We also have healthcare. So how do we actualize apprenticeship opportunities in those spaces and engage learners in that if that's not a trajectory that they've been um, comfortable going into or have not always conceptualized that they can go into. The third phase, which took us about a year to do step one, step two, and step three, was to plan specific details. And there was, again, a lot of conversation. <laughs> this involved and engaged us thinking strategically about how do you deliver a statewide apprenticeship model across a wide variety of regions with a wide number of adult education providers and employment and training providers. So here's our timeline that we have followed thus far. We really, like I said, started this process in August of 2021. Our state association joined the Michigan Apprenticeship Advisory Board uh, by the December or late holidays of that time. We were working on some of those subcommittee pieces that I was talking about. Um, in April of 2022 is when we established that there would be a grant and that our programming team would need to meet regularly and consistently to think about creating this grant that would ultimately create apprenticeship opportunities for individuals without a high school diploma or equivalency. Over the last year, June 2022 to just this fall, our grant RFP and programming team met consistently and regularly and established the parameters of that grant. And just last week, our grant RFP was released and it will be returned here uh, by the holidays. Um, and actual programming for our apprenticeship and adult education providers will take place over uh, the next year and a half. We are now in this process moving into both step four and step five. And this is following that same innovation process model. Step four is that we've implemented our steps and we're waiting for that RFP to close so that we can award these grants to these adult education uh, and um, workforce training partners. And then we will move into the evaluation step. Along the way, we have been evaluating this process from the beginning. A couple of key takeaways that I can just see is that um, it's taken, like I said, a lot of learning and a lot of conversation. Uh, we have a dedicated state apprenticeship expansion team staff that really did take a, a, a time to understand the adult learning landscape in our state. We also learned as adult educators and as the representative of the state association, sometimes we don't do a good job of, un of explaining adult education. <laughs> sometimes there's nuances to that programming. Sometimes it's unclear uh, of what happens uh, in our programming. And so we learned a lot about how do we articulate the current state of what we're providing in adult education as well as what we would like to see in terms of training or apprenticeship opportunities made available uh, to, to our adult learners. The other thing that I would like to share with you is that there were some key kind of takeaways that are important um, to note in terms of trying to establish apprenticeship opportunities across adult education providers, workforce development partner agencies, and training providers as well. All three of these uh, partners are needed for a successful apprenticeship model. I'll just reiterate that again. All three of these partners are needed for a successful apprenticeship training model. And if you don't have one of these partners at the table, uh, 
it is ultimately the apprenticeship model will not be successful. In our role as adult education providers, we need to understand and what we've tried to establish with this RFP being available in our state is that adult education needs to be at the table. We are a conduit, we're a pathway, but there are certain responsibilities that we have and there are certain weaknesses that the adult education system, at least in Michigan has. And so we need to understand where our lane is, what our responsibilities are and our contributions. In terms of what the adult education provider can bring to an apprenticeship model or apprenticeship process, that would include obviously the robust educational programming. We need to guarantee and ensure that we will have butts in seats and delivering instruction when we say that there will be instruction available. In addition, uh, we know that in order to bring adult learners into this landscape, just like with our regular adult education programming, we need to have an active recruitment strategy. We need to think about what that looks like to build a cohort, and we need to identify who exactly uh, will be most successful in this apprenticeship landscape. It's tough work in apprenticeship. There are long hours, there's large contributions, and it takes the right candidate. Uh, and so what does that look like in terms of our registration processes, processes and identifying who those candidates might be? We also know that at the adult education level, we need to have quality instructional staff and curriculum. We must ensure that our curriculum is aligned to the college and career readiness standards, if not the training provider standards that they will be able to share with you. Um, we've got to track their daily attendance. So much of apprenticeship opportunities are built into tracking attendance hours and engagement of a learner, as well as any assessment testing and academic skills progress monitoring uh, is needed. And then to state any of our uh, funding needs and respond to any funding requests from the workforce development or training providers. These are things that we already do in our regular adult education programming. And so uh, I think it would be very helpful to just note and pay attention that those things are um, what we already do. Let's lean into our strengths and deliver the best quality service that we can as the adult education provider within this cohort uh, of apprenticeship possibilities. Secondly, the workforce development partner agency must be engaged. You must be engaged with your local workforce partners. Sometimes there's a, a, a wall built between our education and workforce partners. We've got to jump over that wall. We've got to go under the wall. We've got to break that wall. We've got to explode the wall. We've got to remove, we've got to get to the other side of the wall. And we have to understand what uh, contributions our workforce development partners bring to this. The first and foremost is that they know the employers in your area and they uh, have dedicated fostered relationships with them. They also can leverage additional funding. One of the funds uh, available in our state is called Burial, Barrier Removal to Employment Success Services, Breeze Funding. And so that funding can be leveraged for any uh, participant or adult learner who is pursuing education and training. It can't, however, be used for just a learner who's pursuing educational opportunities. It has to include that training opportunity. The workforce development partners in your local area will be knowledgeable about um, those types of additional funds that can be leveraged and what kind of recruitment strategy might be helpful in finding those learners and those participants that will be most successful. Uh, they can also provide additional services that are really important to any apprenticeship or training process like resume building and interview services. And they can also work to provide recommended placements with employers upon completion. For them, it's a business transaction. They want to say to the employers, hey, look, we've got a partner that will bring to the table a number of learners and participants that will be gainfully, that will go through this training and then will be gainfully employed within your agency. 
And they can also leverage additional funding for certain certification costs that are often not allowable uh, under adult education, state or federal uh, programming allocations. The training provider also has key responsibilities in building this apprenticeship pipeline and, and most importantly, being on a statewide training provider list, your state probably has one. Essentially, what that training provider list does is certify that that training is in compliance with either state or federal standards regarding um, uh, its integrity, its course duration, and ultimately the certifications that it leads to. And so the last thing that we would want to do is work with a training provider that ultimately does not certify our participants in a statewide or national credential. What a loss to our learners if we're not uh, per helping them pursue an actual certification. So it's important that we are aware and cognizant of training providers who are certified who have gone through those process. In our state, we have the statewide training provider list and I would encourage you um, to look or reach out to your workforce development partners in your state to identify what that statewide training provider list looks like and where it's located. The training provider can also offer contextualized materials. As an adult education provider, we don't have to do it alone. We've got partners that say, this is what we want our uh, employees and our, apprenticeships, our apprentices to learn. And your role as the adult education provider should be say, give me it all, give me everything, give me everything you've got, and we'll break it down. And we that's our expertise. We, we will teach them exactly what you need us to teach them. They can also, again, like I said, work on a recruitment strategy. They've got a lot of contacts. Sometimes they've got money that they can leverage. Um, they can also offer incentives sometimes. Uh, they can work with the employer as well to offer incentives for people to participate in these types of programs. Uh, and again, they just must also have that rigorous content that leads to state and national certification preparation. The last thing, I'll just reiterate again, the last thing we want is to not prepare our learners uh, for quality success. So bringing it back to Michigan and where we're at, uh, we went through this process, like I said, really over about a two year process, identifying the roles of our workforce system, identifying the roles of adult education providers, identifying the roles of um, training providers and employers. And that has led us to our current state, uh, which was formerly our desired state. We wanted to create funding opportunities led by adult education programming two years ago. And we're now at the position where we're able to offer that and to do that. And so last week we released a request for proposals and RFP for nearly a million dollars in our state to provide apprenticeship training opportunities for individuals who currently do not have a high school equivalency or diploma. Previously um, in our state, many of our apprenticeship training opportunities required one of those credentials already. And so this is an exciting opportunity for us to reach into another population and engage them in um, a pathway that was not accessible for them before. So this RFP did a couple of really important things. It identified some lead partners and recommended partners. The lead partners identified in this RFP are adult education providers. That means that while our adult education providers will be leveraging the expertise of workforce development partners, as well as training partners and employers, they are the driving force. They're not just an added on component into this. They're not just invited to the meeting after the fact. They are the ones that will be leading the charge here and recruiting and getting um, learners into this space, which is very exciting. It also did something else. It emphasized regional collaboration. That is so key and critical in our state. There are some adult education providers based on their population they serve, based on where they're geographically located, that may not be able to offer a adult education apprenticeship cohort of 25 or 30 learners, but maybe they can offer five. 
Uh, but in collaboration with other adult education providers or other training providers in the area, maybe that region or that locality or that geographic area will be able to offer a cohort. Ultimately, um, this grant, it's never enough money, right? <laughs> it's almost a million dollars. But the hope is that there will be five to six um, uh, grants awarded across the state to equal that amount. Um, and that could be an individual provider or regional providers. Something else that we were intentional about and that I would encourage you to think about as well is that in any conversation about an apprenticeship, there has to be a little bit of something for everyone. So in this particular grant opportunity for our state that we are sharing out, there's dollars that can cover the cost of the training itself, there are dollars that can cover the cost of adult learning and then any employer costs for the apprenticeship as well. So that there's a little bit of um, incentivization for everyone at the table to participate in this apprenticeship opportunity. Um, sometimes in the adult learning space, we can't leverage our funds for anything else besides instructional costs and admin costs. And we know that in the gray are all these other costs that come up unintended. So this allows for kind of a more comprehensive approach to funding that. And I would encourage you to think about that as you explore apprenticeship opportunities in your area. It allows for leveraging braiding, braided funding as well. Adult ed providers are able to kind of continue their work and leverage their existing programming. They don't have to hire a new teacher always. They don't have to create a new whole class, they can really kind of embed this within to what's happening. And ultimately it puts adult education in the driving seat or even the passenger seat. They're no matter what, they can look out the front view mirror, which is so critical and important and something that we've been trying to champion in Michigan. Something that we as a state association are offering to our members and people within our state, and I would encourage you to think about participating in if you are uh, in your own cohort or thinking about an apprenticeship opportunity in your state, is um, participating in any and all informational webinars on apprenticeship. <laughs> you should do that uh, just naturally as a function of your job or assign a particular staff member to be able to do that. That's so critical and important. I'd also encourage you to think about going back to that innovation design model that I walked through a little bit ago and think about how you might follow that same process in developing your own adult education apprenticeship model. It really is an integral process. It really is an important process to walk through that. And it's important to outline the current state of where things are at and the desired state of what you'd like to accomplish. Sometimes by writing it on paper, you realize that things <clears throat> are a lot further down the road than what you thought. But you also might realize that um, your desired state isn't what you intended it to be. I would encourage you also to be part of a cohort of support. That's something that we're doing with um, the ultimate grantees of this grant and providing them professional learning opportunities. You also may have an apprenticeship learning uh, network within your state. Check with your local Michigan, or in, in, I should say in Michigan, our workforce development partners are called the Michigan Works Network. I would encourage you to think about um, connecting with your local workforce development, a workforce development partner, if they have an apprenticeship learning network. If you could sit on those meetings, if you can learn about that, if you can talk to one of their apprenticeship uh, navigators or talk to someone who's responsible for apprenticeships and understand how you can be part of that process, if they can understand how you can be a part of that process, I would take the time to do that. And then lastly, I would think about aligning your current current programming uh, and how you can expand that into apprenticeship training. If you are offering career and technical education within your institution in collaboration with your adult education programming and or IET, Integrated Education and Training Programming, you are halfway there. You are almost there to the apprenticeship model. 
Um, if you're not offering one of those, it doesn't mean that you can't start. Um, but if you are offering one of those, you're already on the road to understanding how to embed curriculum, how to integrate both education and training models together, how to engage local partners, how to engage employers in that work. And so really a lot of that legwork and hard work that you've established is already done. You just need to um, kind of look at the parameters to bump that up uh, to the next level. IET CETE 2.0, and think about um, what those apprenticeship opportunities might look for um, your state, your learners, and built, building upon the success that your program has already. So what's my next step? Um, I'm going to answer a few questions here in a moment, so I'd encourage you to put questions uh, that you have into the Q&A or into the chat. And I'm happy to answer those. Um, but I wanted to leave you with a few things to think about as you think about this process. Um, a few takeaways for me is that this has been an intense project and it takes some time. So if you can have some patience and you can have some passion, which I know in adult education, we have lots of passion. But if we can have that patience as well, you will be successful and you will be able to see the fruits of your labor. Um, again, though, this was a process that for us in Michigan, we started two years ago. And so it was really critical. Um, the time is now to that you start, start these conversations. So I would ask these four questions or I would reflect. And so maybe take a moment to think about this. Who should I identify as a key workforce partner to begin this process? We must, we have to work with our local workforce development partners. So who's that person? Is it the same person that I meet with or been talking with? Can they point me to an apprenticeship person? Should I be talking with my other local or regional adult education providers? Do I know someone within the adult learning community already who has that strong established relationship? Who are those people that I need to identify that I should learn more about? The second is, is there an employer in your community that you know is ready to engage? It could be that guy that you see at the grocery store every week that you've been friends with for a long time. It could be the person at church that sits in the pew behind you. But well, who is the person that's ready in your community to have this conversation? You know who they are. You can probably identify in a short list uh, people that would be ex readily um, accessible, willing to communicate, understanding of the adult learner population in your area. Who are those people? Those people um, can be a great partner and should be the person um, that can be your champion for you. The third thing would be to consider what apprenticeship opportunities already exist. The last thing that you wanna do is duplicate service, effort, or time, or spend more resources on something that is already established or something that's already established and has not been successful. So this is where, as adult education providers, you need to lean into your workforce development partners, your training partners, and other employers, and try to understand what is the landscape within your area. This is also important to consider the economic factors within your area. What's the long-term trajectory over the next two, three, four, five years? As you build out this programming, the last thing that you wanna do is prepare learners for, let's just say, use an example of a phlebotomist when there are no phlebotomy jobs forecasted over the next three years within your area. So if you don't have that expertise, um, your registered apprenticeship partners within your Department of Labor will have that data as well as your local workforce partners. So I'd encourage you to think, reach out to them. And then lastly, this is a broad question, but it's an important one. How can you leverage into and not leverage out of existing programming? We don't have to do it all in adult education. So how can you, what do you, what assets do you have to bring to a table? You may have questions about how apprenticeship works. You may have questions about the current landscape, but once you kind of get an understanding of answers to those questions, it would really be important and I behoove you to think about 
what then is your contribution into that landscape? And as soon as you can start identifying what those contributions are, and I'll go back to this slide, or the left-hand column, these are really core contributions that no, regardless of if you are in a public entity or a private entity or a nonprofit entity, adult education provider, or you're in a state funded or a federally funded or both funded or no funded, these are really kind of core common things that all adult education programs do nationally. And so those, at least at the very minimum, should be conversations that you can have with other partners to say, this is what we do. These are the things that we can provide. Because ultimately for a successful partnership, those other partners in that partnership need to know that at the end of the day, you will do a minimum of what you've said that you're going to contribute to. And so it would be important for you to think about what can you leverage that's already there. You don't have to reinvent it. You don't have to do it totally different and new, but what can you leverage that you're already doing? as a part of your enrollment, as a part of your registration, as a part of your um, integrated education and training class. Hey, we're gonna have an employer come in and we're gonna talk about apprenticeship opportunities at, towards the middle of that programming so that they can think about that. We have a ESL population that's ready to transition into adult basic education. Let's get them thinking about what their next step is. How, now that they've got the English language proficiency down, what's their next step? And what would they like to take advantage of? Think about those junctures to add into your programming steps, processes, and capabilities to make this be successful uh, for your program. I've shared a lot of information with you, and I'm happy to dialogue offline about all these things. Uh, the recording will be sent out as well as all of the materials, um, but you can reach me um, for the next few days at the very least at this email. I am transitioning to a, a, a new opportunity next week, but I'd love to chat with you about what things look like in your state. I see a few helpful resources shared in the chat as well in terms of process and progress that other partners have made in this landscape. But I hope that this week and this presentation have just been an indicator for you of how important it is that we continue to do quality adult education work and quality adult education services, that our programming can and does align to training opportunities like apprenticeship, and that this week, National Apprenticeship Week, should be a kickoff to more conversation with more partners about how you can be dialed in. Ultimately, the success is shared across all of us. Um, if someone enters into an apprenticeship opportunity, it's a game changer for them and their life. It's that generational impact for the training provider. They've been able to get someone through and have their dollars used valuably. The employer sees a benefit and that they've got an invested worker, an invested participant who understands the contributions that employer has made to their life and is probably going to be loyal and work there for several years. And for you as an adult education provider, you have the satisfaction of knowing that you've helped someone uh, reach their goals and their dreams. And you've also uh, checked off a WIOA performance metric <laughs> as a secondary goal. Um, but all of those things lead us to the successful partnership between adult education and apprenticeship and training providers. Uh, I would encourage you to think about more dialogue, keep having conversations with those partners, and think about ways that you can be a part of, of this landscape. Uh, I do see a couple of questions before we come to the end of time. Uh, one question was, how many people work in your department that focus on adult education while the learner is at the apprenticeship program? So I'll answer that question first. We have a staff, I believe between eight and 10, within our Department of Adult Education, but a lot of this apprenticeship opportunity has also been shared by the staff at our association, which is two to three staff, and then as well as our um, state apprenticeship expansion staff, which is another five. So a lot of hands have gone into kind of this statewide uh, strategy. Uh, at the local level, it varies. We have providers that have one and two staff up to 25 staff. Um, so that really depends. Um, 
what other type of funding did you work with and was that enough? So mainly in our state, we have two funding sources. Uh, one is we have state funds, which are primarily accessible to our public school adult education providers. And then we have WIOA Title II services, which are federal funds um, that are able to leverage. So those funds in and of themselves are not able to leverage apprenticeship uh, costs, but they are able to leverage adult education instructional costs. And so um, through braided funding with this particular grant and with other local funds, we can cover some of those costs. Um, overall, adult education with apprenticeship, did you feel you have the support to make it attainable? Yes, it just takes some time to bring all those partners to the table together. Um, like I said, it took a lot of conversation. We all want the same things. We all want a positive outcome for the states in which we live, and we want people to be successful. We want employers to be happy. We want our economy to grow. And if we just reminded ourselves of those opportunities, um, we just kept the conversation going. And I'll say we also had a lot of donuts at our meeting. So if you can throw in some donuts, I know it's not always an allowable cost <laughs> under federal or state funding for food, but if someone can pitch in five bucks for donuts, that goes a long way in, in helping these conversations. Um, and then Glendy's asking what kind of competition is running right now. So the example that I was giving is a state uh, of Michigan competition that's available for our adult education and workforce development and training providers to offer apprenticeship opportunities. Um, it's using federal funds, um, but it's being leveraged through our state Department of Labor. Um, and yes, as a portion of the grant, there will be um, each provider that submits a budget is able to leverage costs for adult education instruction, training costs, and employer incentivization as a function of the apprenticeship. So all three of those entities within the successful apprenticeship will be able to ask for and leverage funding under this grant, which is really key and critical, I think, to the success of this. Um, so I think... Uh, just a model for you to think about and a model for you to, to look at. And I will um, turn it back over to our co team if they've got anything else that they would like to share. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you for to everyone who joined us today. What a great session. Um, I did launch a poll. So if you could fill that out before you leave um, and everyone have a great afternoon. Thanks again, Patrick. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. And thank you and enjoy a National Apprenticeship Week.